morning. If it weren't for Natalie, I'd think it was Wednesday night just about. We've got, uh, besides Natalie and Doug, it's the youth worship team and former youth staff. So that's pretty exciting. Well, it is good to see um, all of you here today. It's nice to see the room full. Seahawks must have not made it into the playoffs, huh? I think that's what, I'm assuming that's what this means. Be careful. Fair enough. Would you, if you would, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Psalm 15? And as you're doing, would you be kind enough to stand again as you're able to honor the reading of God's Word? We're reading this morning from Psalm 15. A Psalm of David. Follow along as I begin in verse 1. O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Would you pray with me? Father, like David, we desire to be those that would dwell near you, and you are a holy God, and it is required that those that approach you do so in holiness, and your standard is high. And we acknowledge this morning that apart from the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, none of us could approach your holy hill. And yet through him, it is our privilege to do so this morning. In fact, as your word says, we can come boldly even now before your very throne. And so we do so. But we desire that we would not be unchanged by both your son, by your spirit, by you yourself, through your word, that we would be conformed. We would be conformed in our actions and in our words so that we would walk with integrity and we would so be able to picture who you are to this world. And so we pray this morning that in your word you would encourage us to do that very thing. And so we ask this in the name of your son. Amen. You may be seated. Anybody notice there's a lot of liars in America? (laughs) Yeah. Um, and yet, anybody notice that the word lie is one that we very studiously avoid hardly ever using? It's become almost an art form in the English language to dodge admitting any time you have actually lied. And that has led to a wonderful field of vocabulary. We have alternative facts misstatements, misrepresentation. I like taking factual shortcuts, being economical with the truth. You know, we've got to save for a rainy day. Oh, here's one of my favorites. An inoperative statement. Strategic misrepresentation. A false narrative. Or here's a good one. It was a truthful hyperbole, (laughs) terminological inexactitude. You can thank Churchill for that one. One individual caught in a lie said, no, I wasn't lying. I was creating a fiction. (laughs) Or here's a good one. I didn't do the thing that it turns out I did. Uh, I was over firmly denying an accusation. Or the ever popular hashtag, fake news. It's funny, uh, and it's not funny, both at the same time. Uh, God is certainly not amused at a culture full of lying, and even more so by a culture full of lying that refuses to acknowledge that it is lying. And this morning, we're going to be reminded how important it is for our words to be true. 
and our witness to be trustworthy. And so we jump back into the Ten Commandments. And if you've got your Bibles, you can flip in them back to Exodus chapter 20. So we come to the Ninth Commandment. So we are nearing the end. And as a reminder, as you're flipping back there, of the importance of the Ten Commandments, as we've gone through, we've really seen how they function and represent a moral good. These are not just laws for society. They represent the standards of Yahweh. They represent His character. They dictate how He must be worshipped. And even though today, as for the most part, a bunch of pig-eating Gentiles that have been grafted into the family of God, we are no longer underneath the Mosaic law. We have seen that the heart of God represented in the Ten Commandments is a heart that hasn't changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. They also represent civil good. These commands demonstrate how to wisely establish any nation. These principles are the bedrock of social order and human prosperity. And it is true that to ignore these principles is to move in a trend towards madness. And they represent relational good. Relational good. Finally, as we've noted many times along the way, these commands capture what it means to love God and to love man. Love is not a concept that transcends law. It's a heart affection expressed in keeping law one to another. And this week, as we look at the ninth commandment, we're once again going to see how important this law is, both in its immediate and obvious fulfillment and also in its wider implications. And I'm going to focus our discussion initially this morning on the topic of justice, Justice, it's a word that's been abused quite a bit of late, but let's try to pull it back from the brink of meaninglessness and understand how God meant to create a society that would be truly just, truly righteous, and the importance of trustworthy character to that endeavor. And that is going to be as true in our families as it is in our church, as it is in our country And we're going to see this as well, a central principle that underscores all we're going to read this morning, and that is this, Satan's chief tactic in opposing God is lying. Satan's chief tactic in opposing God is lying. And that is one of the reasons why this sin is so particularly serious and it is so particularly harmful in every situation and human relationship in which it manifests itself. I mentioned last week that stealing is Satan's gospel. We can gain heaven by taking it for ourselves. And this week we are reminded that Satan preaches his gospel with a forked tongue. Satan opened his wretched temptation in the garden by doing what? Declaring himself to be a character witness to God and giving false testimony. That was how he opened up his first gambit. And that which brought about the curse on all of creation is that which still brings about destruction anywhere it is tolerated today. And so if we want to live in a just world, we need to be committed to truth, even when it hurts. And so this morning, I want to look at the importance of trustworthy witnesses, first of all, to justice, the importance of trustworthy witnesses to justice. And we're going to see you cannot have justice without honest witnesses. To have any form of justice requires an honest witness. In Exodus chapter 20, we read in verse 16 very simply, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's our verse for the morning. It's a little bit longer. We've been looking at two word long in the Hebrew verses for the last couple commandments, three commandments. But now there's a little bit of extra information. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. And the word neighbor is going to appear repeatedly in the ninth and 10th commandments as it focuses on those relationships. This is the first place where it's introduced. This is how you are to honor and safeguard not just yourself and not just your worship of God, but this is how you very proactively protect and love your neighbor. And this is expounded in a few chapters, in Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 through 8, and you can follow along on the screen as I read, where he says, You shall not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. 
You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your needy brother in his dispute. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of justice. And there are so many forms of dishonesty explicitly forbidden here. Any intentional collusion to subvert justice is forbidden in verse 1. Repeating the sentiment of a mob without firsthand knowledge is giving false testimony according to verse 2. Being biased in favor of the poor is injustice in verse 3. Allowing injustice or harm passively by not taking action you could to help your neighbor, even if that neighbor is your enemy, is injustice in verses 4 and 5. Ignoring the plight of the poor is injustice. In verse 6, accepting false testimony willfully because you want to believe what they're saying is injustice. Verse 7, and allowing bribery to influence justice is wrong. In verse 8, have any of these not been a significant headline just in the last month? So let's see if we can offend everyone. Ready? Let's conduct an experiment. A country that tweets hashtags for social justice outrages before the facts are known is a wicked country. A country that assumes a poor person or a minority person or a poor minority person is right before the facts are known is a wicked country. A country where the testimony of a woman must be believed before the facts are known is a wicked country. Disclaimer, really important disclaimer, that does not mean you don't take immediate action to protect someone claiming to be a victim, even if a determination of the facts are still in process. A country in which a white male is assumed to be innocent in a dispute with someone of color before the facts are known is a wicked country. A country in which a popular social view is determined by courts to be constitutional or an unpopular view unconstitutional before the facts are known or even after the facts are known is a wicked country. A country in which money, political favors, or positive press coverage influences the outcome of justice before the facts are known is a wicked country. Good thing we don't have any of those problems in our nation, right? Good thing we don't have any of those problems in our church, right? How does a nation become such an almost comical farce of justice? The answer doesn't lie out there somewhere in a lying potion. The answer is to be found in here, in our own hearts, and the patterns of dishonesty that we tolerate in our families and in our neighborhoods and in our churches. As Leviticus 19.11 reminds us, this begins with the basic necessity of not dealing falsely or lying to one another at every level of society. Little white lies? No. Convenient exaggerations? No. Frustrated distortions of actual events? No. Evasions to make myself appear godly? Or, accept, or gain acceptance. No again. And yeah, that hurts. Yes, it does. Me too. Hashtag. <laughs> so can we move on? Sure, let's talk about gossip and slander. Leviticus 19.16, a few verses later, reminds the people of God to not go about slandering each other. Is there someone in your life that you always want to paint as the villain? Maybe somebody who has a genuine, actual villain streak. 
but you embellish and curate until that person can do no good. There is no point of compassion or sympathy in your heart for them or in the hearts of anybody that you enjoy sharing all of these juicy tidbits with. Do you have a pattern of getting ahead in social circles by carefully assassinating the character of others? I would never. That sounds like something Henry would do. I hope there's no Henrys in here this morning. <laughs> this is where it begins. What we're seeing writ large on the headlines of our nation is merely the overflow of what we have long tolerated in our hearts. All of us. And that is what this command is calling us to stop doing. In contrast to this, God's people are to be people whose word is held in high esteem on account of a pattern of genuine honesty. Like wisdom herself personified in Proverbs 8, our mouth will utter truth and wickedness is an abomination to our lips. All the utterances of our mouths are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that could be said about each and every one of the children of God? And as we read this morning, and as David wrote in Psalm 15, the one who can dwell with God is the one who walks with integrity, who speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, who will not take up a reproach against his friend, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, and who would never take a bribe against the innocent. I like how the Heidelberg Catechism summarizes this when it says, never give false testimony against anyone, twist no one's words, do not gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone rashly or without a hearing. Rather, in court and everywhere else, I should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are the very devices the devil uses, and they would call down on me God's intense wrath. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. There's some good marching orders. Love the truth. Speak it candidly, openly acknowledge it. That's not always easy, and it can be costly. Not everyone wants to hear the truth, and sometimes the mob is looking for multiple people to torment, not just the one that they are currently putting in the crosshairs, and speaking up puts a bullseye on you which is why justice requires not only honest witnesses, it requires courageous witnesses. Courageous witnesses. It is always going to be true that the innocent often rely upon the testimony of those who will risk losing something to speak the truth. In Israel, bearing false witness was not just an active sin, but it could also be a passive one. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1, we see this captured. It says, now, if a person sins after he hears a public adjuration to testify, when he is a witness, whether he has seen or otherwise known, if he does not tell it, then he will bear his guilt. You are considered guilty before the court for failing to testify to the truth. In any situation where you had either been a witness or you had knowledge pertaining to the case, we often say God expects us to speak the truth. And sometimes we just think that means God expects us not to lie. But it also means God expects us to speak the truth. As Stuart, John Stuart Mill observed in 1867, let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. And obviously that turned into a number of similar quotes. But this is true. And boy, do we see a lot of this today. Up, oh, none of my business. Moving on. And yes, this can get complicated. Do you tell someone you just found out their spouse is cheating on them? Do you report your company that you just found out is engaged in some shady business deal? There are often times when questions such as these involve a number of factors and it is wise to proceed carefully with much prayer and with counsel. However, 
Should you speak up to defend the innocent? Yes. Should you call and affirm what is righteous and call sin what God calls sin? Yes. Should you speak up even for your worst enemy if that individual is falsely accused and if you have exculpatory testimony? Yes. In matters of justice, it is quite simple. We are to speak up on the side of truth. We are to speak up on the side of the innocent. And we are to speak up on the side of God. And that's a pattern we have to develop in the small things long before we're ever in a situation where God might require us to give testimony in a context that would be a larger platform. Justice requires courage. God's people must be courageous people. But it shouldn't rely on the courage of a single individual because justice also requires multiple witnesses. Multiple witnesses. A last but very important principle of witnessing is found in the words of Deuteronomy 19 in verses 15 through 21. And the main point in these verses is captured right there in the first verse, verse 15, which says this, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Justice should not ride on the testimony of a single individual. This creates such an opportunity for abuse because it means that the innocent are left without any means of actually proving their innocence. I'm reminded of a recent trial in which the accused found himself facing a general public assumption of guilt. And he was facing a single accuser at the time and loudly protested his innocence. And I watched an interview with some expert who was waxing eloquent about how the victims must always be believed, etc. And the interviewer finally asked, is there any way that this accused could prove his innocence? And the response was to the effect that even if multiple witnesses were produced and convincing evidence was gathered in favor of the accused... The victim must still be believed, and the accused should still have his career ended and exit stage right immediately. That is scary. That is a scary world to live in. Throughout Scripture, this principle of multiple witnesses is upheld. It is repeated explicitly throughout the law, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, and in Deuteronomy. In the New Testament, in John 8, 17 to 18, Jesus appealed to this principle to prove his right to the title, Light of the World. It was the basis for the operation of church discipline in quoting this passage in Matthew 18. Interestingly, the Jewish leaders tried and failed to convict Jesus on the basis of this passage. They tried to hire worthless fellows, but they had to find such worthless fellows that would be willing to condemn Jesus that they were too stupid to say the same lie. And so they had to appeal to Jesus condemning himself on a blasphemy charge. It was appealed to by Paul in his confrontation of the believers in 2 Corinthians 13.1. And Paul uses this as the standard for receiving an accusation against an elder. In 1 Timothy 5.19, it's not just an Old Testament principle. It's a biblical issue. It's a safety issue to protect the innocent. And does that mean that there may be situations in which a guilty person is let go because of a lack of enough credible witnesses? That could happen. But you see in Scripture, in the world in which our human knowledge is limited, you bias towards the potential innocent. And in that case, it is better that there is a potential for the guilty to go free than for the innocent to be punished. Trustworthy witnesses are extremely important to justice. And for a society, for a church, for families to have justice, there needs to be integrity. Honest witnesses, courageous witnesses, multiple witnesses. We've got to build that into our children. We've got to check our own hearts and how we speak with our friends and how we deal with people at work. We need to develop a culture of honest, courageous, and communal testimony. Because trustworthy witnesses are not only important to justice, 
they're important to Jesus. They're important to Jesus. The importance of trustworthy witnesses to Jesus. Jesus requires honest witnesses. One of the many titles of Jesus, and one that we should probably mention more often, is one that appears twice in the book of Revelation, both in Revelation 1.5 and Revelation 3.14, where Jesus refers to himself as the faithful witness or the faithful and true witness. Jesus was the perfect example of a pure witness declaring what is true. In fact, as Jesus famously declared in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus was a true witness to the Father and to the real plight of man and our only hope. And that is exactly what he calls us to do as well. In Acts 1.8, Jesus speaking to his disciples said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. This is our mandate, to be the witnesses of the faithful witness. That's our marching orders. Jesus said, If you follow me, I am sending you to bear testimony. In Zechariah 8.16, we are given an outline for a peaceful nation. It says this, These are the things which you should do. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. And in Ephesians 4.25, that's the verse Paul quotes to give us an outline for a godly church. When he says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are to have an honest testimony to the world. We are to have an honest testimony to each other. This is important to Christ. Truth in love is how we imitate Christ and how we establish our words as trustworthy. And this begins with the little things and extends all the way to the message of the gospel. It is hard to underscore how important truth is. Because truth is reality. We live in a world that has separated the concept of truth from the concept of reality. Because reality is relative, right? So truth must be as well. And God has said no. I am the one who declares it, even I. This is what reality is, and your job is to testify in accordance with that. And so we must do so. And I would like to, in, in honor of that, propose an idea. Let's declare today to be Liar's Amnesty Day. If you are convicted of an area where you have been untruthful, then... Today is the day you have permission to deal with it. And that doesn't mean that lying is just ignored, but that today we rejoice that lying can be confessed, repented of, and forgiven in a day. There may be ongoing consequences from a pattern of lying in our lives, but our conscience can be clear of harboring untruthfulness today. That sounds like it's at least as important as the Super Bowl. And most of us are probably going to find time to do that. Find time today, if there is a, a measure of injustice and of untruth that you have been clinging to, to make that right, to declare truth where you have proclaimed falsehood. And as the body of Christ... Let's not act that shocked when we find out that somebody may have lied and is coming to us to ask for repentance and forgiveness. But let this be a day of grace and love to cover the sins of one another so that we can move forward as a church in truth. And so having put aside all falsehood, we are ready to speak with conviction about the person and the work of Jesus. And that will still require courage. Because Jesus needs honest witnesses, Jesus also requires courageous witnesses. And if you're really clever, you can probably figure out the last blank. 
The Greek word for witness is the same word we get our English word martyr from. The great cloud of witnesses spoken of in the book of Hebrews includes a not insignificant cloud of actual martyrs. Speaking out for Jesus is not going to become less costly even for us in this country unless God does a great miracle. One of the most important ways that we take a courageous stand is by simply refusing to adopt the narrative this world is constructing in opposition to the truth. And that is a a wonderful opportunity for us to take a courageous stand because there has to be for every worldview a story that explains the way things are. There has to be. Otherwise, it's not a worldview. Every worldview has some way of accounting for the fact that we are here, has some way of guessing at where we're going, has some way of determining what I should do right now, and some way of evaluating between differing ways of approaching life. And so we should not be embarrassed to say, no, the world didn't start the way you say it starts. It started the way God says it starts. We need to say clearly, no, love doesn't mean what you are trying to say it means. Love means what God says it means. We must be courageous to declare, no, you aren't basically good. You basically need Jesus or you're doomed. We build credibility by having integrity in every area of our life, but our high calling is to be courageous in declaring the truth about Jesus from his cross running all the way back to before the world was created and from his cross running all the way forward to an eternity in a new heavens and a new earth. Satan is spinning quite the yarn here in the West, isn't he? It's a tale of man oozing his own way out of the chaos of random chance and nutrient-rich goo and clawing towards a bright future of self-made glory. With the inertia of natural selection behind us and the compass of our fleshly desires to guide us, we are aiming for the stars. That's the controlling narrative of the West. And the people of God need to declare, not so, not so. For the glory of Christ and the love of your neighbor, are you willing to speak up against this false testimony and to declare the truth? And note, this does not actually require being a jerk. It doesn't actually require any yelling. In fact, to do it properly requires a whole lot of compassion and listening and grace and patience, but an uncompromising commitment to the truth that we are all doomed if we do not see reality as it really is, and the way it really is is the way that God tells us it is in his word. And I hope that we will be those kind of courageous people. And I hope as well that you will not find yourself alone in that here at Valley Bible Church, because Jesus requires multiple witnesses. Jesus didn't just pull Peter or Paul aside in Acts 1.8 he made the declaration to all his disciples. It is part of the instruction that we are to pass on to all new disciples of Jesus. Jesus appeared to the 12 and up to to as many as 500 people at one time after his resurrection. He made sure there were plenty of witnesses. And he is making sure that he has plenty of witnesses to this day. We stand with the Father and the Holy Spirit and in accordance with the Word of God, And that's not a bad lineup of witnesses to join. But we also gather on Sundays to stand with each other. We gather together to do this that we might encourage one another and love one another and edify one another, but also so that we may join with one another and testify together about Jesus. And we do that in our singing, and we do that in our ministry, and we do this in our study of God's Word. And we do this in our giving of offerings. But as a church, we perhaps do this most specifically and poignantly and particularly when we come to observe the Lord's table, which we will do in just a minute. One example from history that I really like of what it means to courageously take a stand in doing the right thing comes from Carl Ludwig, known as Lutz Long. You may recall... 
He was a long jumper, a German athlete, the record holder for the long jump back in the summer of 1936, and very excited to compete in the Olympics in Berlin in 1936. And he was competing across from this upstart black man from America. And as you might recall, Jesse Owens was not Hitler's favorite athlete. And Jesse Owens almost didn't get to jump alongside of Carl Long because he kept faulting on his initial attempts to qualify. He kept stepping over the line when he was jumping in the long jump. And so Carl Long came over to Jesse Owens, sitting on the field dejectedly after faulting yet again, and said, hey, buddy, you can clear the qualification line by a lot. So stop trying to jump at the line. Jump four to six inches short. You can do it. And an encouraged Jesse Owens returned to the line, jumped short, sailed long, qualified, and the two of them went on then in the final event to break five world records. Jesse Owens taking the final record and earning himself the gold medal and Carl Ludwig Long earning silver. And guess who was the first person to congratulate Jesse Owens right in front of Hitler's face? And guess who was the person to put his arm around Jesse Owens and head back to the dressing rooms right in front of Hitler's face? That's courage. That's courage. That is not the kind of courage that he found that day. I am willing to bet that is the kind of courage from a man who was committed to integrity his whole life, who was trained to do the right thing regardless of the cost his whole life. He would later lose his life in the war in 1943, but he left us a great example. And that's about a long jump. What standard of courage ought we to show for our Savior in view of the gospel? An essential part of communion is bearing witness. Jesus came to this earth, the incarnate God-man. He lived a righteous life, performed miracles, suffered, was crucified, buried, rose again in victory over both sin and sin's wages of death. And he now offers forgiveness before God and life everlasting to those who put their faith in his work. This is the claim of of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus Christ says is the true message men need to hear. And whenever the church comes to gather around the Lord's table, we both remember and we proclaim these words are true. It is not a sentimental religious practice. It's not just something cute that we do because it makes us feel all warm and religious-y. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a declaration that certain things are so. And to take communion is to say, I have staked my very life on the conviction that I am an eyewitness to the truth of this claim. You've come this morning, if you come to the Lord's table, as a witness that Jesus has given you a new heart, a living hope, has given you his Holy Spirit. And as we've discussed, this requires an honest witness. We must speak of what we have come to know. We do not partake of this meal because it is sentimental. We don't partake because our parents did. We don't partake because we don't want to stand out or miss out. To come to this table for such reasons is to bear a false witness. And that is why if you're a guest with us this morning or you're here this morning and you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ and in his claim that he alone is the savior of man and that only through him can we have our sins forgiven, then we are very glad you're here, but we ask that you do not partake of communion as it would be inappropriate for you to declare in taking communion something that you do not in fact believe. And we would invite you warmly, please talk to us about that of which we are convinced this morning. Communion is for true witnesses to the work of Jesus. 
Communion also requires courageous witnesses. When you partake of communion, you are making a public declaration. You invite the scrutiny, you invite the disdain, or even the persecution of those who reject Jesus. Our Savior did not beckon us to a private faith, but to a public witness. Think of those around the world who risk their lives every time they come to gather around this table. And think of your own life. Are you willing to stand by this profession should it cost you everything? Communion costs us very little in this country, but it should nevertheless be taken with a spirit of courage that our lot is thrown in with Christ, come what may. And as we take the cup that represents his cost, we ought to count ours as well. And communion requires multiple witnesses. It's not by accident that Jesus instituted this ordinance for the church during a gathering of the saints. It's not a coincidence that throughout the New Testament we see communion observed whenever the saints are gathered and never when they are alone, to my knowledge. Communion is the church's opportunity to gather multiple witnesses together and to declare that indeed, on the basis of this gathered assembly, on the basis of these trustworthy witnesses, we declare the claims of Christ to be true. And so then, with honesty and with courage and with one another, we can come this morning to observe and to testify. Let's make this morning a line that we draw, perhaps, to check a pattern of convenient untruthfulness where we no longer allow alternative facts to be a part of our vocabulary, but that from our gospel declaration to our smallest human interaction, we stand for truth. And if you're ready to do that, and you're willing to do that, then would you join together as we sing this song, both as an offer and an encouragement and as a witness. And so let me invite the music team to come forward. And as the elements go around, would you please hang on to them, and we will partake of them together at the end.